My name is Eddie Joe. I'm an intensive care physician, and in today's video, I'm going to be discussing utilizing endexpiratory occlusion for measuring whether a patient is volume responsive or fluid responsive, or uh, some people call it preload responsive. Any one of these things to help us determine whether or not a patient will benefit from receiving IV fluids in resuscitation. I'm not gonna to get too deep into how it works because that's all called the heart-lung interaction and that could be a whole video within itself, but I definitely recommend that you look into this whole heart-lung interaction if you plan on being a resuscitation expert as it's pretty cool stuff and um, it explains a lot of how resuscitation actually works. As always, I recommend that you go to the show notes and read the citations for yourself. I think I utilized six different articles for this particular segment, lecture, video, whatever, but the vast majority of them are free. And uh, I definitely recommend you read the articles for yourself and don't trust me, as none of this is medical advice. The whole situation is that you have a patient who is critically ill in your emergency room or in your intensive care unit, and they are on mechanical ventilation. So what you wanna do is if they're hypotensive or they're hemodynamically unstable, you want to potentially give them IV fluids, but you don't really know if they're gonna benefit from these patients or not, because at the end of the day, giving patients too much fluids causes them harm. And what are we here to do? Avoid as much harm as we possibly can. So by using end expiratory occlusion pressure, we could decrease the amount of fluids that we give our patients and limit the harm to them and hopefully get them better faster. So one of the key caveats is that the patients need to be on mechanical ventilation. They need to be intubated. On top of that, they need to be able to tolerate a 15 second expiratory hold, meaning that you hold their expiration for 15 seconds on mechanical ventilation. This is usually done depending on the ventilator by holding on a certain button. Now for those people who uh, work in ICUs where the respiratory therapists are very, and appropriately so, they're very, uh, they, they guard their, their ventilators with their lives, I definitely recommend that you speak to them prior to touching the ventilator and involving them in the process that you are making the patient undergo at this time. Now, there's some studies that state that a 15 second expiratory hold is sufficient, while there are other studies that suggest that a 30 second expiratory hold would be better. However, in 2020, there was a meta-analysis that was uh, written by Gavelli, which you can download in the show notes, which shows that there was no, no statistically significant difference between using a 15 second hold and a 30 second hold. So tidal volume is another question that is often asked for performing an end expiratory occlusion. And the reason for that is because when you're using stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation, it is recommended that the patient be on at least eight cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight as their set tidal volume on their ventilator. However, the data has shown that in using end expiratory occlusion, you can actually use less than eight cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight, and you can use six, which is something that we often use in our ICUs for patients who are on mechanical ventilation. Going back to that meta-analysis that was published in 2020, just two years ago, which by the way, today's date is the 24th of October of 2021 for historical context, and in case any of these data have changed. But in that particular uh, meta-analysis, it showed that for, and I'm gonna read this, tidal volumes of less than or equal to seven were had an area under the curve of 0 0.96 to, to reflect uh, volume responsiveness in these patients. Now, you could use tidal volumes greater than seven cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight, and here it showed that the air into the curve was 0.89, which using 0.96 is considered outstanding the best, but an air into the curve of 0.89 is still excellent. And I don't know if I mentioned this before, the reason why tidal volume is important here is because when you're using other methods to determine fluid responsiveness, such as stroke volume variation and pulse pressure variation, the ventilators need to be set at, at at least eight cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight. So here you could potentially use end expiratory occlusion for patients who are on mechanical ventilation and who have their uh, tidal volume set at less than eight cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight. Another question is, does the PEEP that we're providing through our mechanical ventilation circuit actually affect the end expiratory occlusion? And going back to a paper that was written by Gavelli, but not the meta-analysis necessarily, they showed that patients having a PEEP between 5 and 14, it should be fine. 
Now, a meta-analysis showed that PEEP settings greater than or equal to seven perform better, but again, this was marginal from, from the way that I was ex able to extrapolate the data. However, you should extrapolate the data for yourself. I know that this is not gonna change my clinical practice as I'm not gonna be adjusting PEEP settings to try to obtain a more accurate endo-expiratory occlusion pressure. For those of you who have patients who are on mechanical ventilation and prone, I wouldn't really recommend that you use it in this patient population. I mean, at least not to this day, it does not seem to work very well here. So now that we know what we need to check off, in other words, patients need to be on mechanical ventilation, we know what tidal volumes, we know how much PEEP, we know they, they can't be prone, we know that they need to be able to have an expiratory hold of at least 15 seconds. Now that we have all these things taken care of and all these boxes checked off, what do we need to do at the bedside to actually perform an endexpiratory occlusion pressure? So one person is going to be at the bedside, well, everybody's gonna be at the bedside, let's, let's be honest about that. But one person's gonna be on mechanical ventilation and they're gonna go ahead and do an expiratory hold on the patient. Once this happens, well, even before this happens, we need to have some sort of device to measure what the cardiac output is on the patient. And what is mostly used in these different studies is something called pulse contour analysis. Now, these might be brands such as the, the Pico monitor, the Edwards uh, EV1000 monitor, slash the FlowTrack. There are other devices that provide this pulse contour analysis. However, there's more recent data that the bioreactants, in other words, machines such as Cheetah, would work for this. Now, one could also consider using uh, other methods such as VTI for those people who have the skills to perform echocardiograms at the bedside. But again, what is mostly used for these validation studies is the pulse contour analysis machines. So what we are going to do is go ahead and obtain what the baseline cardiac output is on these patients. In other words, you're gonna have that as your baseline. Then when you're going to go ahead and do the expiratory hold, what will take place at that point is that you will go ahead and remeasure what the patient's cardiac output is. Now, fluid responsiveness is, is defined in various ways. And what I mean by that is it's a change in stroke volume, a change in cardiac output, a change in cardiac index. And these are all things that I've described in the past. However, they've actually found that the validation for using end expiratory occlusion is best when it's actually most positive when the, when the percentage increase of the cardiac output is just 5%. Other data say that to define fluid responsiveness, it has to increase by 10%, some say 12, et cetera. But here, using end expiratory occlusion, it's only 5% increase in cardiac output, and that will go ahead and predict that the patient is fluid responsive, which is pretty cool. And for further data on how to actually set up your device to make the end expiratory uh, occlusion pressure accurate for those people who have the Cheetah device, which uses the bioreactants technology, that is listed in the show notes. So now that we know how to perform an end expiratory occlusion pressure, and I hope at some point I'll actually go into the ICU and, and uh, film the ventilator and film the flow track machine that we have at my institution. But what they actually found is that using the end expiratory occlusion pressure was actually better when comparing the areas under the curve to the passive leg raise, which is pretty surprising because at the end of the day, passive leg raise is, com is considered to be the gold standard for monitoring, for assessing, excuse me, fluid responsiveness in patients. But then there's a bonus, and this was something that was seen in the 2009 study by Monet, where they found that by just performing the end expiratory occlusion pressure, they were actually able to see an increase in the mean arterial pressure, and that alone would, would help us to determine that the patient was fluid responsive or not. Generally speaking, I do not use an increase in mean arterial pressure when, when uh, doing a passive leg raise or providing a bolus of fluids. That is not defined as, as fluid responsiveness. But what they were able to do was to correlate the positives in the change in the cardiac output and the change in the mean arterial pressure while doing the end expiratory occlusion test to say, hey, you know what? At the, end of the, at the end of the day, this actually does work for predicting fluid responsiveness, which is a cool bonus to having, you know, to doing this particular test at the bedside. Now, there are people who work in the cardiothoracic ICU, and also this could be something that's helpful for cardiac anesthesiologists, but there's actually data that this is actually helpful in cardiac surgery patients in the perioperative period. And there was a study that was performed uh, in China, at least that's what, I, what, I was able to, what I'm able to recall, and it was published in July of 2019. And this article is also free for you to download down in the show notes below. 
but here they performed a 20-second end expiratory occlusion test and simultaneously they were doing transesophageal echoes on the patient and measuring the VTI. And so they found that the area under the curve was 0.9 to predict fluid responsiveness by using the end expiratory occlusion pressure in cardiothoracic surgery patients, in other words, cabbages and valves and things of that nature. And they found that it actually worked in this patient, in this patient population as well. So to wrap this up, let's say that you do have a patient, you perform the end expiratory occlusion pressure, you find that the patient's cardiac output measured by whatever way you want to go ahead and measure is, is uh, goes up by greater than 5%, like is, the, like is uh, validated in the studies, or if you wanna go ahead and use stroke volume, if you wanna use cardiac index, if you wanna use VTI, um, any one of those particular ways to assess for fluid responsiveness, Let's say you do have a positive change and yes, the patient is fluid responsive. So what do you go ahead and do then? Well, again, this is not medical advice because this is just a video on YouTube and I'm just a guy talking to a camera right now. But what you would do is go ahead and give the patient a 500 cc bolus through a pressure bag and make it do its thing, increase the stroke volume, make it actually work for the patient. And I've gone over in the past why you don't just go ahead and put it on the, on the pump, on the Oleris pump or whatever company you might have at your, at your respective institution and hit 999. And it has to do with the fact that 80% of the fluid that you give in a liter, in a liter uh, basically extravasates out of, the, out of the intravascular space into the extravascular space within an hour. So if you're gonna make it count, if you wanna see an actual change in the stroke volume, you need to hook that bad boy up to a pressure bag and let it rip. So that wraps up my video for today. If you learned anything, if you aren't watching this on YouTube, please leave me a thumbs up because it helps out a bunch. If you're watching this on IGTV, leave me one of those hard things. Please share it with your friends who you think might benefit from learning these data. And also subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. It really helps out the, it really helps out the algorithm and leave me some comments saying, hey, I didn't know this before. I greatly appreciate you teaching me this because at the end of the day, we're all learning this together. We're all trying to take patients, take care of patients, excuse me, the best way possible. Hope you all have a great day. Thanks. Bye.